I was very happy, like, you know, this feeling of, of success and, wow, my career is going very well. I was not looking inside, you know. I was more busy with outside things, like my career, how to move to the capital, how to be successful. I started thinking, like, wow, what, what, what is the sense of, like, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of my life? One Argentinian, he was working um, in a restaurant and he, I just, I was alone. So I talked to him and with him and he told me that he used to travel around all South America, uh, just working a bit here, a bit there, and he was very happy doing that and he felt very free. He said, wow, what a freedom he has. I would like to have that. The mind started opening, opening, and then we went to, to uh, Peru again. And over there, one guy told us like, oh, you, you are going to Lima, you should go for our meditation retreat. Uh, 10 days in, in noble silence, for free. The motivation of our trip changed and we started looking for more digging in our hearts. One American yogi, um, I was doing service with her in Damagiri and she was bright. She was so peaceful. She was so happy. I said, wow, wow, where, where did you go? She said, no, I, went, I just came back from Myanmar. Oh, I want to go to Myanmar. We were only going um, um, tradition. Uh, actually, we didn't know the tradition worth at that time. We, we thought that that was the technique and that was the way of meditation, and later on, like after coming to Myanmar, like like this, uh, this new panorama of many meditation techniques. I met also nuns and monks, um, like communities that we don't see in Goenka tradition, and it was like, wow, wow. The interview that follows with Sayale Kantachari, a Buddhist nun from Colombia who has been living in Myanmar for several years, was one of the most moving interviews I've done to date. We've had guests speak with courageous honesty before on the Insight Myanmar podcast, and indeed, frank and fearless discussions about the Burma Dhamma is one of the primary objectives of our overall work. But I don't think I've yet heard someone speak with so much emotional honesty, and I think that is part of the reason why I found this talk so touching on such a deep level. Our discussion unfolded slowly at first. As she later confessed, a nervousness set in during the initial few minutes. She was unsure about the purpose of the talk and wondered how so much conversation time would be spent. But she soon settled in and what followed was deep, rich, and inspiring. As you will hear, while the arc of her story clearly inclined towards the Dhamma, it vibrates with tender human emotion and the interview stuck with me days after. Sayale Kentichari infuses so much open-hearted honesty and vulnerability into her story that I think one can't help but feel more vulnerable oneself as well just in the listening. 
After the interview, Sayale circled back to her initial reticence, mentioning that the experience felt just like two Dhamma friends having a wonderful conversation, which just happened to be recorded. I'm gratified that Insight Myanmar has been able to continue hosting such a diverse guest list. An inaccurate and somewhat odd narrative with the Orientalist and neo-colonialist overtones prevails about the spread of Dhamma, that it moved primarily from traditional Asian countries to middle-class or affluent white communities in the Western world. A continued adherence to this distorted storyline causes us to overlook the richness of the Dhamma's actual spread around the world. In part to combat that narrative, on these podcasts, we've interviewed both native Burmese voices and practitioners from the U.S., Europe, and across Asia, and Sayale is the third South American yogi we've connected with. There's great value in hearing voices that are not from what we traditionally think of as the West or the East, but rather that provide another layer for understanding how this practice has continued to shape our lives and cultures, no matter where we're from. Now it's time to take in Sayale Kantachari's story in her own words, a story which begins with her life as a girl in the Colombian countryside far outside the capital, Bogota, and ends with her as a nun sitting down in a Yangon recording studio. Let's get to it. I just let you know uh, my English is not native English. So, it's fine. Yeah. So it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you should start doing interviews also in Spanish, you know. I have to learn Spanish first. Yeah. Yeah. But I think many of the people, you have a lot of contacts that actually speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I remember the translation in Spanish of, mm -hmm. of the Golden Land. Yeah. Some part, Shuelang, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So... It might be interesting, I It'd was thinking. It would be good. Yeah. It would be good. It's a whole other audience out yeah. there. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. So you reminded me that last time we met each other was at Shredagon. Yeah. And several years ago, and I didn't remember that. And then later in the conversation, we were talking about a Colombian couple, and I said, oh, yeah, I think I met them too. And yeah. then <laughs> realized that I had met you as a layperson, uh -huh. and that's why I, the image wasn't coming in my mind. So. Yeah. We were a very different human beings at that time, you know. Uh-huh. Very different. I also, my 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 picture about you is uh, totally different. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was long ago. Yeah. So I was, yeah. At that time, I was only in Myanmar. I just arrived to mm -hmm. Myanmar. Maybe I was doing the ITVMU diploma. Mm -hmm. That's the International Theravada Buddhist Missionary University. Yeah. The, a mouthful. ITVMU. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in Yangon. Yangon. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, uh, I, I like to call it like a scholarship. Mm -hmm. So at that time we we were there and then we have this meeting with Anutara mm -hmm. and um, the other Burmese LA, Burmi, um, Chanda Dika mm -hmm. LA. Mm -hmm. So it was an Uaga. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was our first meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. So you're from Colombia. Where are you from in Colombia? Um, I'm from Bucaramanga. Mm -hmm. Um it's a small city in, in Colombia, um, very conservative place. Mm -hmm. Conservative, uh, how? Um, uh, really like Catholic. I went to a, a Catholic school, mm -hmm. only girls, mm -hmm. and like a lot of these kinds of schools in mm -hmm. the city. <clears throat> At that time, it was a small, like a small city. Um, and, uh, you know, like left uh, family values and just very close friendship mm -hmm. like um different from the capital mm -hmm. so that is my like uh, uh standpoint to compare because bucaramanga is uh, different from bogota and the 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 mindset of the people from the capital and then the uh, like the province mm -hmm. uh, different mm. so um, yeah i grew up there until Later, I moved um, to Bogota. Right. Did you grow up in a religious Catholic family? Yes. Mm. All my family is Catholic, and mm -hmm. there are some, how to call dissidents, but they are mm -hmm. Christians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, all the family is Catholic. I, I grew up as a Catholic also. I did every formal step. and. What was your faith like? Um... It was, uh, I tried to to go to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to, like, be kind with everyone, try to share, um, and try to 
to see like the qualities of God mm-hmm. in in me in the people around mm-hmm. the the religion was very strong for me when uh, these values of Catholicism were very strong mm-hmm. during my high school mm-hmm. um, so you would call yourself a believer yeah mm-hmm. I think so during yeah. that during that period sure, of sure. time uh, really really I I had a strong faith actually uh, but later on when I went to the university uh, uh, little by little mm-hmm. like the the knowledge was uh, like huge knowledge, mm. knowledge, and like start reading more about religion, and mm. I start lose. Uh, I like lost faith, mm-hmm. and I was not any more interested in in Catholicism. Mm-hmm. I I didn't I didn't feel um, I was like receiving what I need at that moment of uh, in my life. Mm. So I just like st- step back a mm-hmm. little bit. And but anyway, I I I kept my like my moral principles with mm-hmm. with me, and I think that was very helpful. During, right during that young age. Right. So you grew up really um, uh, involved in Catholic education and religious practice, and then by the time of university, started to have some doubts, or it wasn't quite meeting all your needs. And from there, uh, how? Um, what led you onto your spiritual journey that you're on now? What was the, the earliest? Yeah, actually, I think during the whole um, university, mm-hmm. I was really just a focus on the on the a career mm-hmm. and just trying to figure it out what to do with my life, um, and then you you know like starting the. Uh, productive life to find fi- trying to find a job I mm-hmm. want to move to Bogota that make my my mind busy I was not really looking for something special mm-hmm. or I was not looking inside you know mm-hmm. I was more busy with outside things like my career mm-hmm. how to move to the capital how mm-hmm. to be successful mm-hmm. um, and then just I move on to I, I moved to Bogota mm-hmm. And uh, in Bogota, I'm so I met a different like a spectrum of, of, sure, of sure, people, new right. friends. Mm-hmm. Um, I start also working with um, indigenous, um, and like in Colombia, we have um, a different, uh, actually a lot of groups indigenous and with different also kind of views about the world. Mm-hmm. So I start like the the opening. To, to different cultures mm-hmm. and different kind of friendships. So at that moment, I think I start like, wow, there are different things. But but still, you know, in my in the mindset was mm. just enjoy the life. Sure. Uh, going just a normal normal right. life, you know. But right. Normal in the sense that I had a good job, good friends. Uh, you know, good parties also, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, boyfriend. And How old were you at this time? 20, 23, So I was early, early 20s. Yeah, yeah it sounds yeah. similar to my experience when I was in Tokyo around the same age. Mm-hmm, and yeah, mm-hmm. just away from my own culture, a bigger world, expanded universe, yes. lots of opportunities, yes, yes. a sense of excitement, thinking this is the life. And then what happened? So then um, I went to a job uh, like uh, that was like the last best job I had ministerial like a mm-hmm. mi- like a government right. like top uh, government place mm-hmm. and I was very happy like you know this feeling of, of success and wow my career is going very well and mm-hmm. I was like you know I, I like that kind of a feeling um, of uh, being just happy and okay and mm-hmm. everything was good fine mm-hmm. but I had um a, a boss that it was no so uh, he was very demanding mm-hmm. and he was uh, really straightforward forward with with us and mm-hmm. about like you are this is not uh, good enough mm-hmm. you need to do more and um, at that time I also start to 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 look in what like what is my purpose yes I have a good job but how I am helping others. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow, like that is a, a big motivation I have, and 
I was not sure at that time what really I was doing for others mm. apart from myself. Mm -hmm. And I was I was happy because that kind of job, but um, not not feeling content. Right, you had a sense of service. Yeah, oh. and uh, I was a little bit like very naive mm -hmm. and just thinking in myself, even at that time, I was not uh, supporting in any way to my parents or my family, mm. you know. Like very, like very outside, like in mm. my world, my mind. And then, uh, so because of this boss and all like the stress environment in that job, I started thinking like, wow, what, what, what is the sense of like, what is the meaning? Mm. What is the meaning of my life, mm -hmm. what, what I'm doing? And for the first time, I went abroad. Mm. <laughs> so being abroad, and I met m more many mm. different. In which country? Uh, in Peru. Mm. I went to Peru and to a, a congress uh, about anthropology and indigenous rights, and mm. a very interesting uh, subject. And I met also a lot of people. And between that people, I met one Argentinian. He was working um, in a restaurant and he, I just, I was alone. So I talked to him and with him and he told me that he used to travel around all South America, mm. uh, just working a bit here, a bit there. And he was very happy doing that. And he felt very free. Mm. He said, wow, what a freedom he has. Mm. I would like to have that. So when I came back to Colombia, I told my boyfriend at that time, Oh, look, I met this mm. guy. I think I want to do something like that. Yeah. So uh, we, my boyfriend at that time, we decided to do a backpackers trip. Nice. Yeah. yeah how old were you? Uh, 26, I think. Yeah, it's a good time for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe for the U.S. and yeah. other countries, it's, it's quite old. Uh -huh. But I, I met, I, I, I went to a very conservative everything you know around yeah, me so yeah. I, I never thought like um, abroad and yeah, things, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I was very happy and satisfied mm. like like in my city mm. with my friends you mm. know and anyway we went into that trip and that was the trip to the Dama mm. so we went to Ecuador like he's hiking the most part mm. of the trip. And so we stop in Ecuador and then we start seeing different things uh, outside Colombia. Uh, one of the first things I, I start feeling about the culture was feeling safe, not being afraid of mm. being outside mm. in a dark place in, in Ecuador. Right, in Colombia you had that fear. Yeah, sometimes. Right. Uh, especially in Bogota. I don't, I don't mean all Colombia. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's, it's, it's not so safe mm -hmm. meeting with the kindness of, of people that mm -hmm. you don't know. Mm -hmm. That is the first time you, you, you know. Mm -hmm. And very beautiful Ecuador. And then you know that the heart starts like the mind starts opening, mm -hmm. opening. And then we went to, to uh, Peru again. And over there, one guy told us, like, oh, you you are going to Lima. You should go for our meditation retreat. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten days in, in noble silence and uh, for free. Mm. Uh, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it, it sounds good, uh, but I was like, what? Ten mm -hmm. days in silence? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't want it. Yeah. Um, at that at that time already my husband so mm. so we 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 married in you the married way. your boyfriend yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so he said no we should go this mm. is a very good I say no I don't want to go mm. you go alone and mm. stay with my friends yeah. finally uh, we went together mm. and that was our his first time and my first time in uh, in in like uh, closing uh, like being close to a meditation technique. Mm. And then... To, and which tradition was this? In Goenka. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to the Dhamma, I, is my first time, like, mm. near 10 days in, in silence, like, trying to keep quiet, trying to not to communicate, trying mm. to see what is happening with your mind, mm. uh, like, listening so um, straightforward Dhamma talks, uh, 
it was really, really a very important experience in my sure. life. What year was that? Uh, well, two, I think 2011, no so okay. long yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. so yeah, long yeah. ago. So you've been on a fast track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A very fast one, <laughs> yeah. Well, It's like no, this no stop, no yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, like too many things in very, very few. Wow, uh, yeah. wow, wow. I was thinking this was some time ago. And, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> no, only two thousand. I think 2011, right. and it was a really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And after that, like that, actually changed all our plans mm. of uh, the backpacking trip. Mm. So mm. after that, we... That's great. It affected both of you in the same way, too, because, yeah, yeah. you know, different partners can be affected in different ways. And, no. Yeah. For, I mean, I don't say we 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 reflect the same way. Sure. We saw the same. We had the same kind of um, conclusions about the technique. But at the end, we were both, we were happy. Right. You had both made profound changes in your life at uh -huh. the same time. And uh -huh. I remember when I took my first course in Tokyo mm -hmm. and I was so profoundly affected that, and I didn't know what to do with this new, um, this, uh, th this new practice and way uh -huh. it was transforming my life. And it was, it definitely, I, I wasn't in a relationship, but it had a different effect on the different friendships I had. Mm -hmm. And because some, many of those friendships were oriented around other kinds of activities and, mm -hmm. And some of those friends, the friendships transformed, transformed to a higher level because they also kind of followed on that path and were making those same changes in their life. Um, and then the ones that were were kind of continuing on as before, it became became more difficult. So with a partner, uh, and especially one that you're married to and traveling around with, that that's just all the more um, important of how how you're sinking and yeah, this practice. Yeah, yeah, it was like I <laughs> sometimes I think this this is like. A very good romantic story of mm. uh, in Buddhism, you know, uh -huh. Theravada Buddhism, in the, in the frame of um, Burmese. I, I at that time I didn't see what was happening, mm -hmm. uh, but it was really, really a start. Like it's a very bright spark uh, in our lives. So what happened after that first course? The the, the motivation of mm. our trip changed. Mm. And we started looking m for more digging in our hearts. Mm. So we went next to Argentina to mm -hmm. uh, also Goenka. Mm -hmm. So we learned, actually, we started learning about uh, the retreats and that actually they were right. not only in Peru, but all through South America. So we said, oh, perfect. Um, mm. Maybe we just can catch up the dates. And so we did. I mean, uh, it was not easy because you, at that time, even at that time, the retreats were full, uh, especially for uh, for us in the female side of the of the retreat. Mm -hmm. But we had these uh, suitable conditions, and then we went and practiced and did uh, more ten day retreats in Argentina, and then we stayed for a while in Brazil also. Mm. And that really, really changed us. At the like, Vipassana Center in Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah in yeah. Damasanti. Right. We start, it has been so fast. Mm. And just seeing that there is a tool or there is a way to to acknowledge what is happening in our mind and how that um, is connected with, with our lives. And I was totally disconnected, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that now I am just, oh, like super connected, mm -hmm. but um, that really was transformative uh, for both of us. And the, the nice thing that was that uh, that uh, make, make us strong our friendship. And it was very fun to share with him. Mm -hmm. Also about he, his experience and my experiences were so different, but But still, the interest for, for the Dhamma knowledge, actually, they're starting to be mm. wider and wider. And then after we planned that trip to be a short one, mm, and then we, we keep it longer, 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 and then we just extend the trip for a, a little bit more than one year. So that was also like our way to renunciation. It was also a path to to let go some, let go of plans, Uh, let go of oh, like going rush for the job. I need to go back to get to not to be um, to not to cut my my CV 
and to get easier a job and yeah. because Col uh, Colombia is also not so easy to find jobs and right yeah. right that's I mean that's really an issue that if you're doing something for longer and longer extended experiences if if it's a shorter time you could say oh hey I had this extended time here mm -hmm. or I did this but then when it starts to grow a little beyond that then it gets a little harder to show how you're developing in your profession in, in your profession so yeah. you're you're it's a sense of renunciation mm -hmm. of the the qualifications and future job opportunities really mm -hmm. by devoting to the Dhamma in that way yeah and um, also also to see different life mm -hmm. you know uh, it for me was like uh, more like mm, to find a really um, way to to approach the what is the what is the meaning or what what I would like to know or to explore and actually it was like also how we look for that trying to to balance our practice with our mm. activities and just mm. combine that mm. and just uh, having like a healthy peaceful, harmonious life mm. with us mm. and with like the partner and with mm. every, everyone mm -hmm. around. So yeah, that was the beginning and without end yet. <laughs> right. So um, last time I checked, there aren't any direct flights from Colombia to Myanmar. Yeah. So there's, uh, you took somewhat of a circuitous, uh, circuitous route in coming here. So how did, was Myanmar your first stop in Asia or how did you end up here? No, so after that, w w like the interest grow, mm. uh, grew to to know about them. Mm. What is that? And of course, when you're in the Vipassana kitchens and serving and everything, yeah. you just yeah. you hear about two places, you know, India and Burma. Um, you keep exactly. hearing about this. Oh, I have to go here. I have to see exactly. this. Exactly. So. And in that order, mm. we decided. So we say, okay, we go to India. Mm. So we went to India. So mm. we save. We work around one year more. Mm. And we save some money. Mm. Uh, uh, fortunately, we had like still, uh, we were young and <laughs> very creative. So um, we, we found a way to, um, to organize. And then we went to India and keep meditating. We did uh, also our first long retreat. Where did you go in India? Um, the um, Global Vipassana Pagoda, uh -huh. Dhamma. Uh -huh. Mumbai. Yeah. 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 The, I, I don't remember. I don't its remember name either. We went to Damagiri, mm -hmm. but then for the long retreat, we went to the where the Pali Institute is mm -hmm. there. I don't remember right now the name. Yeah, but we we stay also. You took a twenty day course or yeah. thirty day? Yeah, twenty yeah. day. Yeah, twenty yeah. day yeah. course, and then that was the first long uh, retreat. Mm -hmm. And actually, in Damagiri, I met uh, also meditators from Myanmar. Burmese. Yeah. yeah. And actually one American yogi. Yeah. Um, I was doing service with her in Damagiri and mm. she was bright. She was so peaceful. She uh. was so happy. Yeah. I said, wow, wow, <laughs> where, where did you go? Yeah. She said, no, I, went, I just came back f from Myanmar. Uh. Oh, I want to go to Myanmar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we planned that trip to India to be a six-month mm. six uh, trip. Mm. But at that time, uh, we took the risk to change our plans. And then we went actually first to Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, the Myanmar idea was really, really strong uh, because we met one, born, uh, one single S monk that was trained uh, in, here in Myanmar. Mm. Um, and he really, really advised us, you should go to Myanmar. Mm. If you are really, really interested in meditation, you should uh, go and learn. Mm. And my teacher is alive. Uh, you should, you should mm. go. Who is this teacher? Uh, Sayadoji Panditarama. Mm. Oh. And then, so we signed for the retreat, mm -hmm. the, this international retreat, and we were accepted. So uh, we we travel to Myanmar, and then we cancel our, our six months plan because it was already over the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we came to Myanmar and sat the the Pandita the Rama Pandita, retreat uh, two months. Was that a, the sixty day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with all like, uh, we 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 were only going um, um, tradition. Mm. Uh, actually, we didn't know the tradition worth at that time. Mm -hmm. we, we thought that that was the technique and mm -hmm. that was the way of meditation. And later on, like after coming to Myanmar, like like this. Um, 
this new panorama of many meditation techniques mm -hmm. and to see the the Buddha, mm -hmm. you know, like the teacher who who was the teacher will, uh, like Myanmar has this strong a Buddhist tradition, and that was really really supportive for our practices. Uh, I can I can talk for me for myself and during that two months retreat I met also nuns mm. and monks um, like communities that we don't see in Goenka tradition right right and it was like wow mm. wow like they are dedicating all their lives mm -hmm. to the practice to studying to to explore the the Buddha's teachings and you know we were like kind of hypnotized by mm, hypnotized yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. by uh, by the Myanmar mm. uh, supportive conditions of uh, meditation right and so we sat this two months retreat and um, yeah and what was that like coming from having practiced a single tradition so intensively and with dedication mm -hmm. to then step out and try try something a new intensive experience uh, difficult how so? <laughs> Difficult because at the beginning, like you, 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 you are like you think, oh, this is the thing, wow, and then you you give, and then um, I was already very happy with mm. um, with the meditation in Goenka, mm -hmm. and then we we learned about Mahasi Sado, mm -hmm. and um, like with a different style and with. Um, more information about the Dhamma. And um, the change of the technique was, um, for me, was a, a bit difficult because mm -hmm. I was uh, already, my mind was inclining to to the breath, uh, like anapana mm -hmm. in the nostrils. Mm -hmm. And to change that, to move my attention to to the abdomen mm -hmm. and to understand, to to get the understanding that uh, there were actually just objects mm, and actually that right. the mind just chief between mm -hmm. objects mm -hmm. like uh, any object in, in our any of our f sixth sense doors mm. and it was uh, a difficult thing to accept but the panditarama teachers are really really persistent mm. And you know when you are in front of a monk because my my meditation teacher at that time was a monk um, with the help with one Sele that was translating wonderful Sele. Um, Sele is nun, we should say. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. uh, yeah a nun, uh, American nun, mm -hmm. very senior. Mm. Um, that was like you trust. I mean, you trust in the in the teacher, and. Um, Every day we had also meetings with uh, Panditarama, mm -hmm. Sayadoji, mm -hmm. in Dhamma Talks. I, I don't remember if every day or every other day, but he was, I mean, seeing this monk. I think at that time Sayadoji was maybe 89 or 90. Yeah, just passed away last year, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think two years ago. Two years ago. ago, okay. And seeing him with that the strength, you know, with that determination mm -hmm. to teach mm -hmm. and totally confident of of, of his words and mm -hmm. and having uh, a living teacher in front of you exactly yeah. and and many many seniors uh, like meditators around it was really really uh, good mm -hmm. to trust and say okay just shift the attention to the abdomen right but if and you were just follow the instructions and that's right good. but one question if you were so dedicated and satisfied with your practice up to that point why did you make the decision in the first place to try something new like the one thing is i i i learned that this was also dhamma mm -hmm. this was also the buddha's teachings mm -hmm. and uh, goenka in one of the dhamma talks he mentioned that if you go, if you finish the retreat and the people start asking you, where were you doing there? Ten days in silence. Mm. What is that? And he mentioned, okay, you just tell the people you are practicing, you are learning about morality, mm -hmm. and you are learning how to concentrate, uh, like how to how to understand your mind, mm -hmm. and that's all. Mm. I saw that the same thing was happening in Panditarama. Mm -hmm. You know, it right, was the, right, it was right. the training of understanding the mind mm. and. Um, it was actually a sim similar tool, mm, mm. similar tool, and and 
we trust um, the environment and everything and seeing also, because this retreat is international retreat, so mainly people from from the U.S., from Europe, mm. Australia, mm. you know, no, no Burmese. Mm. Actually, all foreigners mm. came right. at, that year from China, mm -hmm. from also many places in, in Asia. I mean, it's, it's like a, a very good uh, example, like here is also something important and let's learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we had I have some kind of prevention, you know, like feeling a little maybe a guilt mm -hmm. or oh I'm doing something wrong because mm -hmm. I should only practice this way. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> we just <laughs> okay, we mm -hmm. we just practice it and then um, we learned uh, actually more about um, about uh, the. Uh, like this base mm -hmm. and the grounds uh, to to develop our minds mm -hmm. and to understand better better what is the the Buddha's teaching. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's deeper. Mm -hmm. I, I felt I felt the Panditarama retreat uh, gave me a, a deeper understanding and more joy mm -hmm. in what I was doing. It. Mm -hmm. Like. Um, and also, like more sparks, you know, into into what is the meaning of the training your mind, understanding mm, what is yeah what is happening. Yeah, yeah. It was a really important for me. It was a very important retreat, and right. I stay a longer time there. Um, after the sixty day, you, yeah. You after the retreat, on. I yeah we both, both we stay yeah. Um, um, I stay maybe nine months. Nine months, okay. And this was your first stop in Myanmar. Yeah. Yeah. So you went from the airport to Benditarama, and then <laughs> nine months later. Yeah. Uh, we we stopped in Damagiri. Mm -hmm. No, Damagiri. No, is the name. Dama. The Goenka Center. Damajoti. Damajoti in Yangon, the yeah, the Vipassana Center yeah. and the tradition of SN Goenka. Yeah. yeah. Before before the retreat. Uh huh. And we we learn how to deal with the guilt, <laughs> 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 because at that time we already knew that m we might sit uh, the retreat in in Panditarama and then at that time uh -huh. we start learning like oh this is um, one tradition this is another tradition tradition we don't have uh -huh. this concept uh -huh. you know I, I don't I didn't have the concept uh -huh. of traditions uh -huh. uh, when I start practicing meditation uh -huh. because my interest was just uh, meditation and learning what was there right and um, but anyway we yeah we stopped in Damayoti and then we went to Panditarama yeah. Right. But that sense of guilt, I mean, you're 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 not um um how to say um you're not criticizing or having any negative yeah. feelings whatsoever. Yeah. You're um you're you're benefiting tremendously in your spiritual life mm -hmm. from all of your background mm -hmm. in the Vipassana meditation under SN Goenka. You you have this opportunity to to learn a different technique that basically mm -hmm. you can only learn in Myanmar mm -hmm. and doing it with all the respect and appreciation mm -hmm. of the practice from which you came. Mm -hmm. So by the the mind is tricky, you know. Oh. Like because we also I I have still now and I think I will be always grateful with Goenka. Yeah. I have this sense of gratitude, you know, because mm -hmm. he he even I, I didn't I could not meet him in person, but mm -hmm. he and the group of um, of people around him, uh, assistant teachers and everyone, they built a community that is like a, a door mm -hmm. or a window mm -hmm. to to Dhamma. And this gratitude for him, like, wow, thank you. Mm. Thank you for being so clear about the importance of a mor moral training, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, five precepts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was not thinking in that so clearly after mm. his retreats. Right. And then how that support us to be to be more peaceful, more happy, mm. and just uh, be being okay, you know. So all these... Uh, and then to learn about generosity, what is the meaning of dana? Mm. In his retreats, all this is there. Mm. And I got, I mean, I, I learned from him or from the from the, this uh, school. Mm. And this deep gratitude is like, 
a little bit also of uh, a force inside. Maybe my personality is mm-hmm. this way. So mm-hmm. I was like feeling, oh, I should not do this because, um, you know, they they have been giving me so right. much. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's true. Like also is this kind of thinking. I'm not doing anything wrong. Right. And, but it, it, yeah. it's also like you, you know, the, when the Dhamma, Dhamma has been spreading in some shape or form to the West for, you know, the last m- many, many years, certainly over a hundred, mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. track how, where it came and from who and where it got disseminated. Mm-hmm. But to other parts of the world, it's been a pretty recent um, development. Mm-hmm. And it's not hyperbole to say that in some of these places across South America, that there are villages and mm-hmm. um, and people that were living there that in all of human history had their very first contact with the Dhamma through a course of SN Gwenka, uh-huh. which is an astounding statement to say that in in since the Buddha's time, 2,500 years ago, <laughs> no yes. other teacher has brought this practice to some parts of the world until SN Gwenka, such as how you got it. And, yeah. um, you know, and when you look at it that way, it's just, it's astounding that people living in some of these far off places, far outside the West, which, which uh, you know, has had its own tradition and bringing it back in various ways, have, have been able to benefit from this technique yes. and grow in ways they never thought possible and lead them to where you are here sitting in a recording studio in yes. Yangon wearing nun's clothing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Right. Yes. Yes. So that is, I mean, mm-hmm. you, you, can, you understand, you know, that mm-hmm. that makes us like, uh, this wanting to to help to share this with others sure and it's true in south i don't i don't i cannot be totally sure that uh, zero zero about them mm-hmm. but in my case i never had heard or listened anything about buddhism when i was in colombia mm. it was not my right time you know mm-hmm. later we we learned that we all have the right time and maybe I saw some pictures of Buddha, but mm. that doesn't mean anything for right, me. Right, right. And nevertheless, um, I think Colombia has been also, Goenka has been giving retreats for m- over 10 years now. Mm-hmm. Well, not Goenka himself, but the, yeah, I mean the, the organization. The, the organization. Right, yeah, right. yeah, Goenka never, I think Goenka just went to the U.S. Yeah, I don't think he ever visited South America. No. I could be wrong, but okay. Yeah, I think mm. no, no, mm. no, not at all. And... And then uh, all this movement, and that was, it's a big community, mm-hmm. and it's so beautiful to meet a lot of good people, mm-hmm. good hard human beings. Right. It's like I have hope in humanity again, <laughs> <laughs> you know? After the Goenka retreats. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, I, I learned impermanence. Mm. And Nietzsche, mm. everything is transforming, everything is changing. Mm-hmm. So it's not true that if I have uh, something, uh, w- some quality or a tendency of mine, mm-hmm. it's not true that I cannot work on it. Mm-hmm. I have the chance, the, the, the chance to change that. In Colombia, there is a, actually a big community. I, I didn't have the chance to, to, to be in, in it. I mm. only did one tender retreat in, in Bogota, near mm. Bogota, and I didn't meet uh, a lot of people, just mm. few. And I went to Argentina, in Brazil, the big communities. Mm-hmm. Later on, to let you know, I never went back to, to Colombia to live anymore. Mm. So mm. after Panditarama, oh. we stay here. Yeah, so what happened after that? You spent the next nine months at Panditarama. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. It's beautiful. Panditarama Sayado, his Dhamma talks are full of knowledge. Every night, new concepts, new new ways of describing the things that I was used, used to describe in another way or just to ignore, not to see. So much knowledge. And he, he I think I learned that was the Burmese way of teaching, the importance of knowledge and practice. Mm-hmm. Panya, you know, how you grow your wisdom mm-hmm. uh, through also a study mm-hmm. and uh, reading and just like exploring uh, mm-hmm. in different ways mm-hmm. and meditation. Mm-hmm. So, of course, like nine months, I, I never <laughs> did a retreat more than 10 days. The longest retreat was the 20 days in uh-huh. only one time, 20 days retreat in, uh-huh. in Goenka. And then after two months retreats and then I extend for nine months, uh-huh. 
uh, I need to change a little <laughs> day. I need to uh, to move uh, outside a meditation center. And and at that time it happens. I we heard about the international. Theravada Buddhist University in Yangon mm -hmm. and their scholarships and their opportunities. They're free, right? It's free, free, free enrollment. Yeah. Free. Subsidized by the government. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, we say, okay, let's let's look how what is that? Mm -hmm. And a total different experience from meditation. And so you were starting to see more the value of Pariyati and uh -huh. study. After, after you'd come to the practice from just the in powerful insight yes. in meditation, yes. but from being around Pandita Rama and seeing and seeing how Sayada Upandita would disseminate knowledge mm -hmm. and study Pariyati into his discourses and how much that helped with your your own meditative work, that led you to wanting to undergo um, greater intensive Pariyati training yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I love how you translate <laughs> my words because it's true. <laughs> That is my idea. Yeah, yeah but 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 just but making truth. sure. <laughs> yeah, no truth. Yeah, right, right, that right. that was, and uh, of course the the fear of oh what 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 we are doing. You had fear even then. Uh, because we were already more than one year in Myanmar, mm. and so that means more renunciation to our lives in Colombia. So the fear was based on renunciation. Um, more than renunciation was like um, seeing how our life were changing so dramatically mm. and mm -hmm. uh, just maybe like make a pause in the mm. in the life we were building in Colombia. Right. So we, right. we pause and mm. then you have this, all this, maybe uh, you have the experience also, maybe mm. your family telling you, mm. what happened with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't teach you this. <laughs> what? What? And so my mm, family, mm, Catholic mm. from family, right. all the time very worried. Oh, you should come back. You, mm. you, you. What are you doing? Mm. And what that meditation? How long? Why did it take you, my right. mom? Right. How many years it will take you to <laughs> learn? Why so long yeah. over there? So all these fears, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, we. It's difficult to stop thinking in the future, mm. and we are. We are, in my case, um, I was raised up to be something. And in whatever this thing, I was thought to be successful. Mm -hmm. So being a little bit out of this stream, maybe as the Buddha described, we mm -hmm. are, the Dhamma is maybe against the stream, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. stream of Dhamma. Right, 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 right. So that fear, I mean, mm. this, this, this fear, but... Anyway, we took the choice that we say, yes, we will learn Pariyati. And actually, one of the entrance uh, questions in, in, in ITVMU during mm -hmm. the interview, so there is one examination and then they ask you that you need to give an interview with monks. Mm. And then they ask me, do you know what is Pariyati, Patipati, and Pativeda? Mm. Oh no, I, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, so uh, I think that they just accept it because they uh, she doesn't know anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we we went and yeah. So we stayed. We did a diploma, uh, one year diploma, mm. diploma class, and then we start learning about vinaya. So which is the monastic discipline? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then like exploring more about monastic lives. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the suttas, the, the discourses of the Buddha, mm. and all these deep studies. I mean, really in Myanmar, you, we meet people with really deep dedication to study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some ways, uh, some only by memory, but also really deep. I mm. mean, all the life dedicated to, to these uh, Dhamma studies. And mm. then Avidhamma. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite classes. Mm. And then we just continue. So that were maybe one and a half years more. And at the university? At the university. So it was two and a half years at the university? Yeah. Only, no, we only did diploma, with, but we took a little bit. Um, uh, the university allowed us to, to before our classes, the, the semester, the diploma course uh, started. Mm -hmm. 
we were allowed to to have like extra classes before uh-huh. because we didn't have idea about Bali or really anything. Mm-hmm. Um, even though like all these uh, re- like religious uh, practices. Mm-hmm. And then so we did some months of uh, Bali, uh, beautiful months. Uh, and uh, and then we went to the university. So the, we stay and we live in the university. I think we met at that time when I was uh-huh. in ITVMU. Right. That's yeah. right. We met at Tredagon when, during yes. that time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. And being in the university, so I continue my practice in Panditarama. I used to go on the weekends. They have a beautiful library oh, right. over there. Yeah. And um, and later on, I went back to visit my family. Because, In Colombia. Yeah, because yeah. I promised them to be for Christmas. Yeah. But already two years uh-huh. <laughs> in Myanmar. So I, I had the chance. Uh-huh. One, one friend helped me. Uh-huh. And I went to visit Colombia. And like deeply in my heart, actually, I went to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, and to to tell them that I was fine, uh, yeah, I yeah. was happy in Myanmar, but I want to continue my yeah. my studies, my uh, my life there. Did you go alone or with your husband? No, like, I went alone. Yeah. And so during that time, my husband was interested in ordination, and at that time we already visited one time Pao uh, Doji with a group of friends. And he was very interested in uh, uh, temporary ordination. Uh, we already had uh, one ordination in Panditarama. We were there for each for one month, mm-hmm. and and then so I went to Colombia and he ordained mm-hmm. as a monk. So mm-hmm. you had to give permission, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he ordained. Yeah. He ordained as a monk when I was there, and when I came back, actually, he was. A, is, is, is still a monk mm. and when I came back from that trip uh, two months later I also ordained so that's a pretty intense time in your life you go back to Colombia <laughs> for the first time yeah, after yeah. what was supposed to be a six month trip you tell your family that your um, this extended time which is already beyond what they thought is actually now going to become indefinite while you're telling your family this big piece of news your husband ordains <laughs> you come back to Colum- you come back to Myanmar from Colombia uh, shortly after that you ordain this is a pretty eventful time in your life what year was this yes uh, uh, yes uh, yeah totally uh, it's, sometimes it's like really that uh, is why I tell you what much. year was that that this happened uh, 2000, you know, like maybe 2016, okay. 2016, um, yeah, and here then, and I, uh, okay, I stay Christmas, I stay during Christmas 2016 with my family, mm-hmm. and you know, Christmas is very important mm-hmm. uh, so, time. So before yeah. becoming a Buddhist nun, you celebrate Christmas <laughs> with your Catholic family. <laughs> yeah, I just stay, <laughs> hang out a little bit with my friends too. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I came back and I came back to Pauk. Mm. To Pauk, I went and after two months, I asked permission to say Adoyi, to ordain. And at that time, my husband was a, a monk. Mm. And so, yeah, I started my practice of, as a nun, like mm-hmm. looking how that will support my practice because I felt uh, uh, that was a very supportive uh, uh, tool also in my life when I was in Panditarama. Mm-hmm. Also that moving from Panditarama to Paok mm-hmm. was a bit challenging. Oh, right. Another yeah. move. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And a new move in so short time. Mm. Um but again, this time, no guilt or anything, because now already seeing diversity in Dhamma, and actually that is a personal journey, and so grateful with Panditarama Sayadoji at the same time, and very good Dhamma brothers and sisters now in Panditarama, and still I sometimes I go and visit my Dhamma brothers and sisters, and yeah, so I started uh, in Paok three years ago, my ordination life. Um, mm. what, what made you choose Paok? I need to say Abhidhamma. Uh, I told you I was very, very interested in Abhidhamma when mm-hmm. I was in in the university. Mm-hmm. And I had a very good friend that actually also she's a meditation teacher. Mm-hmm. 
um, a Burmese meditation teacher in Paok, in Paok tradition. This was Sister Deepankara? No, I hope she's my very good friend. Oh, okay, okay, I was just <laughs> I guessing. I wish, I wish this one for a kind of friendship. No, her name is Sayalei Nyana Singhi. She's mm. from Dawei. Mm. She was my classmate. She she also introduced me a little bit with mm. the Paok practice. Mm -hmm. And we went together, actually, the first time in 2015. We went together to to Paok in Piuluin. And we paid respect to Sayadoji. It was amazing. Mm. And at that time, they were having a four-month retreat, I think so. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I met another Western Sayalese. Actually, I stayed with one of them. Mm -hmm. And then I m met uh, like uh, nuns from from England, from Germany, mm -hmm. from Lithuania, from many places, mm -hmm. and also may, uh, like many medi other meditators. It's quite a community there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was beautiful. I was very inspired, mm -hmm. inspired at that time. Mm -hmm. So I decided I, I should practice. I should learn here. Mm -hmm. But at that time, also, I didn't know quite well. So but it wasn't so it wasn't so much the the technique per se mm -hmm. that that brought you there, but the community and the Sayada's presence. And yeah, and but 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 the technique at the same time, I didn't know in detail, but I knew how they were uh, sharing the Avidama practice mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I I had the opportunity to go to maybe two Dhamma talks. I remember perfectly one where the meditation teacher was talking about the discernment mm -hmm. and how to use Abhidhamma like as, as a map of meditation. Mm. And I was just learning Abhidhamma, so that was wonderful for me, seeing how actually the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching is a practical mm -hmm. teaching. And, and plus all this uh, community I saw at that time, mm -hmm. different from the one I see now but inspiring as well. Mm -hmm. And because my husband was also ordained there. So like, all those things yeah. brought you there. Yeah. I, I want to go back to that ordination of you and your husband when um, when he ordained and then you ordained. Was it done in mind of it being temporary or it being wait and see or it being probably this is for a long time? What was the, the intention on both your the sides? The intention originally was a temporary ordination. Uh -huh. And... And actually, he stay ordained like uh, four wasas. Uh, of, uh, how you translate wasa in English? Right, the rains retreats. Yeah, that's like, how a monk marks his years of how many rains retreats he's been okay. in robes. So he's four so, four wasa. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was temporary, but actually our practices like just it just happened. Mm -hmm. Like we were really really into into the life in the monastery, into the practice, mm -hmm. into learning. Mm -hmm. And just the time also just went through. Difficult also mm -hmm. for for my side. Um because it's also the like the changing of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really, really a big change. Yeah. Uh, but somehow also like I found a very interesting time in my life to learn. Mm -hmm. To learn, like, to accept all these uh, transformations that were happening. And, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, at the beginning was just temporary ordination. and But, you know, we, we, we cannot say forever. You still, know? still now, you're not sure if it's forever? No, I mean, I now I am already three years mm -hmm. uh, none, mm -hmm. but the conditions just change. Mm -hmm. and And I have seen so many... Friends also changing uh, from nonhood life to just uh, go back to their homes, and w this can this can happen. Just the conditions are not anymore there. Mm. So, but for now, I I I continue as a nun. Yeah, yeah. I I can imagine in well, you, as a temporary ordination, it's just kind of a temporary change in status of how you relate. But then, as that continues, mm -hmm. there's some kind of. Um, some kind of feeling towards uh, prioritizing mm -hmm. the the Dhamma practice being front and center in your life very clearly over the partner. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I can imagine how difficult that would be. And both mm -hmm. of you are going through it at the same time, where yeah. both of you are are basically taking those vows of marriage mm -hmm. and transfer, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but transferring in some way those vows of marriage into a vow of Dhamma 
I don't know if the vow of marriage necessarily is dissolving and mm -hmm. you're you're still figuring out what you're doing as you go on, but certainly it's being um, uh, put below this new vow of Dhamma that you're taking, yeah. which then you have to completely reorient towards. So yeah. is, that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, uh, to understand that the path of Dhamma is a path that you do by yourself with, of course, the support of others, mm -hmm. including, for example, a partner. Mm -hmm. So, and our relationship was like gradually, gradually uh, transformed mm -hmm. by, of course, by the living in community. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, we felt actually in some point this... Uh, Marish is not anymore, you know. You felt that, yeah. While I you mean, were in robes, you mean? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Do, yes. do you know when, um, like, when that feeling came about? Mm, maybe um, for me was uh, maybe after the first year, mm -hmm. and and we it, it was like we didn't have time also to to talk about. We were just involved in our practices, and and in our. Uh, you know, Pauk is um, like very clear boundary mm -hmm. between monks and the nuns. Mm -hmm. We have actually a very uh, clear separation. So you don't really see him through the day. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We don't. Yeah, I mean, two different communities. Mm -hmm. Each community has a diff different dynamic. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have the same teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a different life. Mm. And uh, so he was in his life with the monks mm -hmm. and male side. And I was also growing mm. my life with the with the nuns in the female side. So actually that was just a, just a natural separation. Mm. And um, yeah, di difficult. Though, uh, yeah. But finally, like at this, at this moment, we are just uh, okay about it. Mm -hmm. And each one, of course, supporting each other, how to mm. break that, mm. that this friendship, you know, mm. and of being comp like partners in Dhamma and, and just supporting as we can to support each other mm -hmm. in our practices. And it's, it's also like a kind of um, good thing to have a friend sure. close like that to sure. talk like, like in like from the first time, like in the Goenka, how, how was your meditation? Yeah. How, what 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 happened with you? Yeah. So still we ha we kind we ha we kind of have this communication. Like uh -huh. How how are you? Yeah, uh, how yeah, is yeah, your yeah. practice going? Right. How, what do you think? And also, this the the seeds that grow in you of um, this is so precious. Mm. Oh, let's share. Mm. And in the way also in, in our ways also we met so many new people also mm. with the same kind of uh, purposes mm. and seeing also about the, sp the Spanish speaking countries and what information is there and mm. what is no and um, all this also like working together mm. to do that like to figure it out mm -hmm. how we can just also put our own seats and or how to put some water in the seats that are al already there so yeah, right now, just um, so he continues his um, his path and and my my way also, and yeah. just but supporting us as friends, yeah. and uh, and happy still to be to be here in Myanmar. Right. So, do you feel like your marriage is officially dissolved then? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Did you yeah. do anything legally with that? Or? So, not not really, um, because uh, so I used to be a lawyer. So our our um, marriage was legal, legally not considered marriage mm. uh, in the in the for the law, but actually we had some papers, and then this 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 is very easy to just make another note to say no anymore from this time. Mm. But we haven't been actually we we actually we visit later Colombia. Uh, he went as a monk, and I also I visit my family as a nun. At the same time? N no, he was in a different period. But we 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 our dates uh, overlap. So, yeah, overlap mm. for maybe one week or two weeks. Mm. Mm. Uh, he was coming to Myanmar already, and I was arriving to Colombia. 
but we didn't actually do any paper mm. or anything mm. because non, uh, there were not not need right. and because actually our mm. our relationship was it has been kind of always re, uh, connected with dama yeah yeah how did your families relate to that decision of seeing you two marry together and have this time together and then they they, <laughs> they don't understand yeah. they don't was, understand was it sad for them they, I think they cannot be sad because they don't understand yeah, <laughs> what, yeah, yeah, what yeah. is what is happening. Um, um, his family is uh, is uh, is okay. My family because they are from the capital, so like the mind is uh-huh. a little bit more open and right, different. Right. And my family is more worried about my future. What mm. I will like mm, sure. what happened in old age and da 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 yeah and their daughters you know yes. around the world living by yes. herself with yes. different hairstyle and yes. fashion and <laughs> <laughs> yeah no hair and all this this uniform yeah. uh, what are you doing um, brainwash and all these yeah. uh, these things but still just connected with them and trying to to share as much as, as I can mm-hmm. through like internet Oh, right. Yeah, with them. But they are okay. I mean, at this point, they are okay. We have been already in Myanmar for six years. <laughs> have so, they visited? No. No, you mentioned there is not fly from Colombia to to Myanmar. <laughs> yeah. they, to go to, they can transfer somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but these visa things, you know, oh, right. Colombian passport is not so easy passport also sometimes yeah. in yeah. some countries. And also it's quite expensive. Mm-hmm. So they will love it. Hmm. But have they practiced any meditation before? No, no, no. I I feel also in somehow they mm, they are more close to Catholicism than before. Mm. When I went as a nun, my mm. mom mentioned, "Oh, you came here to convert me." I said, "No, I don't hmm. have any intention of uh, any right. conversion. I, uh, I am also not convert to anything. Hmm. I'm just." Right. <laughs> I, I, Sheila Maripanya. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it's a normal. I'm a more human being than before, maybe. Um, and another friend told me that uh, she was afraid to. Uh, his boy, her boyfriend was practicing, and or ma, no, my friend was the mom of a yogi, a meditator from my city, mm-hmm. and she was worried about her son to convert. And I say no, the only. He maybe he can convert in a better human being. Sure. Don't worry. Yeah. He will just be your son, but mm-hmm. maybe he will find a way to to explore more his yeah. qualities and uh, just to to know better, to live better. So don't worry. Mm. Uh, so yeah. So you've been it. at Pau continuously as a nun since yeah. that time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. With the break of uh, my visit to Colombia this time. Yeah. What was it like being a Buddhist nun in Colombia? Um, I think there are not other nuns uh, from my country. Mm-hmm. Um, I met some in Tibetan tradition, mm-hmm. I think two nuns. And it was fun for my friends, I think. Mm-hmm. They were very curious about... Uh, what the nun, what 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 is the life of the nun? Uh, what is um, what I do in the day, mm-hmm. and and a part of that, some interest, of course, also in meditation. Mm-hmm. Why I change so much? <laughs> mm. What is making me change in this way? Um, and for my family, was uh, a, like a big. Um, I don't know, shock, <laughs> yeah, because the Catholic, we have a tradition of nuns, actually mm, a sure, strong sure. one yeah, in yeah. Catholicism, but uh, they don't shave their heads. Sure. And um, so the the communities are organized a little bit different, but actually mm. are also very similar. Mm-hmm. And they are com- contemplative nuns, mm. actually, also. In, in Catholicism. So they were um, struggling with uh, with the uniform that they call mm. the, the robes. Right. And, but they were actually also, I, I'm happy because I think they are also going through their own journey mm. uh, thanks to a new world open 
now they know about Myanmar, they yeah. know about Asia. Yeah. They they are taking out their minds from mm. only Colombia. Mm -hmm. They are knowing. Uh, they, so my parents went. There is one Tibetan Rinpoche in Bogota. Mm. I didn't know, mm. but this time I knew, and I visited him with my parents, and they were very happy to see a monk. The the second month monk they met was my ex husband. And mm. actually, they they invite him to Bucaramanga, to mm. my city. Mm. And they offer him like uh, alms food, and they they were very like you know mm. confused a mm. little bit because mm. it's still uh, it's still uh, for them uh, Juan, your son-in-law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, right. Just but. Also trying, you know, yeah, yeah. trying to to care, trying to to learn. Yeah, um, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, he taught a little bit about meditation. Uh, they they talk like sharing mm. and like Q and A, you know, <laughs> like mm. yeah, sitting together. Mm. What you are doing? Why? Mm. What is this? What is meditation? And it was nice also for my mm. family. So it's like growing together, you mm. know, mm. and not not being um, excluded it's not like going to the cave and then i would just disconnect right. with everything right. no no like that no like that also like trying they are part of this is they are we all have our own journey and mm. this is part of their their journey and i think um, good so right. far so far it will be okay so you're looking to <laughs> continue on in your practice as a nun at Pauk for the foreseeable future? Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe maybe you know about the Pauk and meditation. So the, um, the meditation requires like a, a time to, to develop and uh, it can be long time or short time. But anyway, for example, when we choose the, the life of... Uh, monk or a nun, mm -hmm. we will be depending of a community. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, it's a, it, it takes time, mm -hmm. actually. And I, um, I'm just exploring that. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't know how, how long it will take. Uh, but sure. I'm just open to the... Yeah, I mean, you were a Goenka yogi. Uh, you lived at Pantita Center. You were an ITBMU student. All of those that sound like you you rode those experiences yes. for all the value that they provided yes. and have a yes. sense of gratitude and then something new happens. So Pauk, maybe, maybe yes. same thing. Yes, yes. And actually, like, I am... Like, for example, you mentioned the Pariyati, like mm. the ITBMU. Mm. Um, after the diploma, I, I, I saw... I need to keep going with mm. my studies. Mm. So in Paok also we have uh, somehow like a space to mm. reading and learning more. Right. And I, I also are connect, still connected with ITVMU mm. with some teachers. So if they have uh, short classes, mm -hmm. I, I have been there. And also with other Sayados here in Myanmar, you know how rich yeah. Yeah. is the Pariyati world in right. Myanmar. And they, they offer English classes. Mm. There are Plenty of classes. I also try to keep going with uh, Bhikkhu Wadi mm. uh, explanations and courses, mm. uh, like, and just just continue that, um, not to not to abandon them that that part. Mm. And yeah, for now, uh, like the most important thing for me is like uh, keep learning about meditation, mm. and and after that, yeah, the path. I think it will be sh like naturally, mm -hmm. as it happens now, naturally show mm -hmm. what what is next, what is next. So, so far right now, um, uh, it has been just patient mm -hmm. uh, and try to understand that we, we can have some conditions, mm -hmm. we can put conditions, but we cannot uh, control it. So whatever it happened will happen, but of course we put the conditions to we put our mind to our purpose. So right now mm. for me is continuing the meditation. Mm, mm, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, last question: What's yes. the favorite place you've meditated in Myanmar? In Myanmar, oh wow. Okay, so there is a there is a 
place. Um, I really uh, like it in Taton. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a pagoda in the top on the, of that mountain. And going up the pagoda, there is a, like a small a Buddha place, mm -hmm. like inside of a cave. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge cave. Mm -hmm. It's just a simple one. Mm -hmm. But I sat, I was there for a couple of weeks and it really, really felt, I felt connected with the place, with the mountain, with the, with everything mm. that was there. Uh, so I, I, I need to say that place so far has been very uh, good for, for for my practice. But of course, like, it's more than a place, it's like what is happening in, in our practice in the moment. Mm -hmm. And that will make that place like special, like, mm -hmm. wow. I was here, like when I was in Panditarama retreat. Mm. Wow. So I can say that meditation center is my favorite place. Mm. But it's just the conditions of the mind and the sure. perception of the mind, but um, in Paok also, have you been in Paok? Yes, I yeah, have. Yeah. yeah, in Puluin, yeah, so yeah. also very, very special mm. place to be. Um, yeah, but so far this Taton, Taton Mountain mm. is very, very good. Oh, place. great, yeah. great. Any, uh, anything else you want to add? Well, I hope you can... I start uh, maybe with the time also doing a Spanish <laughs> <laughs> podcast <laughs> because uh, there is um, there is some somehow of course I, nowadays there are more information and more mm. projects about the Spanish uh, speaking materials yeah. and and um, I, I think it's going okay. That's great. Yeah, but like this, for example, looking for Dhamma talks uh -huh. or. Um, material, audio material mm, uh, mm, in mm. Spanish. Yeah. Not really, yeah. not really so much as in English, you know. Yeah, well, you're welcome to use the studio if you want to <laughs> interview someone at some point in Spanish, we can put it out yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. So I hope for yeah. you that, and now it's fine. I don't know if you have more questions and... It's okay. Yeah, no, I I think we're good. I know you have to. You're 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 leaving on. Um, where's your next stop now? Uh, tomorrow we are going to. I am traveling with a friend. We are going back to Pulwin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Great. Thank well, you. safe travels and thanks okay. again for your time. Thank you. Yeah. You're I know for a lot of podcast listeners, as soon as the fundraising requests start up, you kind of just zone out or skip ahead until it's over. But I ask that if you're taking the time to listen to our full podcast, that you also take the time to consider our spiel. Some may assume that producing a 90-minute episode wouldn't take much more time than the conversation itself, but there's so much more that goes into it. Several days in advance, our content team reviews the biography and any works of the upcoming guest and discusses the best way to use our limited time together. Our logistic department coordinates transportation for the guest to the studio, and then after the interview, the raw audio file is sent to our sound engineer. One 90-minute episode can take him up to two days of solid work, which is carefully coordinated with our content team to ensure smooth listening. More work is then done recording the introduction of the guest and other segments, particularly the post-interview reflection, and then mixing them back together to upload to the hosting site, delivering the podcast that our listeners eventually hear. We hope each one provides you a solid hour-plus of inspirational and informative Dhamma content and if so, we also hope that you can consider supporting our mission. And if you would like to do so, we welcome your contribution. You may give via Patreon at www.patreon.com slash insight Myanmar, one word, as well as via PayPal at www.paypal.me slash insight Myanmar, one word. That's I-N-S-I-G-H-T 
M-Y-A-N-M-A-R. If you are in Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to get in touch with us. You may want to reflect a little more deeply on some of the themes explored in the last discussion. Following every interview, my friend Zach Hessler and I take some time to process the depth of what was said. Zach has been to Myanmar on numerous occasions and spent three years here as a forest monk, and so we hope that our talk can add depth and context to the interview. He's now living in rural Thailand, and I'll just make a quick call on Skype to connect with him now. Hey, Zach, uh, great talking with you. We haven't checked in in a while. The world sure has changed since our uh, last time of uh, talking to each other. Yeah, right. It's not so often that in the interim that you have like a a big world event happen uh, in the interim. Yeah, I mean, as I'm sure everyone knows and every media report has um, picked up on, the coronavirus has really affected all walks of life. And um, it's affected uh, both of us as well. I am I was uh, recording in Yangon. You're still in Thailand, but I'm now in Colorado. So we're having to uh, coordinate very different um, time zones and um, also a little bit of a, of a technical issue going on that uh, is different from where I was in Yangon. I'm now, I've outfitted a closet where I'm staying in Colorado to be my uh, makeshift recording studio for um, checking in with you and making sure that our listeners get good sound for this. Right. And uh, I got a new mic, so I should sound better than, I think it sounded kind of like I was in a closet before without soundproofing. So it should be an improvement, I hope. Right, right. So be good technical sound um, all the way around. And uh, and then, of course, you know, we've been talking offline about uh, looking at doing some special coronavirus episodes in Myanmar to explore uh, information about what's going on there, how it's affecting meditators and monks and monasteries, meditation centers, teachers, also hearing some words of wisdom from practitioners and how the, what, what a meditator can do during a pandemic, um, some advice and guidance along that. So, um, we're still working those details out and we have some information on the blog and website. So definitely encourage listeners who are interested to, to check in and see what's coming down the pipeline soon. Right. I think that'd be helpful. A lot of people with uh, time on their hands and, and uh, yeah, so, you know, it's a way to, it's a way to give something to people, you know, at a time of, uh, that might be very useful. So uh, very happy to engage in that process. Yeah, right. It definitely was something that no one was expecting, but, uh, you know, hey, things, things change and things happen that are unexpected. And that's, that's also what we learn about in the practice. It happens inside, it happens outside. And this is, this is something new that we're all dealing with outside that also has internal ramifications. So, um, so we'll see how that goes, but for the issue at hand, let's check in about, uh, this interview we just heard with Sele Kantichari, quite an interesting one. Yeah, that's right. And before we get into that, I just want to say I hope everyone's well and healthy and and stays that way. But yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a good message to get in there. Um, so going back to her interview, you know, just just kicking it off, I uh, I like the role. One of the things that just struck me in hearing it and thinking about it again was. Um, you have the role of this this meditator from, or not a meditator, actually, he's a waiter uh, from Argentina that she meets in Peru, and he plays this kind of surprising role in kickstarting her journey. Um, uh, she met him at, at this conference. He was a, a waiter kind of funding his travel, his backpacking around South America, came back, told her boyfriend about it, and they both were like, hey, let's get out of Bogota. Let's, let's do that for ourselves. And basically, they never came back from that experience. And the thing that was really interesting about that to me was it's this sense of openness to the moment. And we never know who we're going to meet that's going to be so important, where we're going to meet them, what they're going to say that's going to change our life. Uh, we don't know wis- where wisdom is going to come from, who's going to say maybe one word or one piece of advice that is going to set us on this life-changing journey. And if you just put yourself out there and you're just open to being able to hear the right thing at the right time, be open to hear it and then to act on it, it really can can have that life transforming effect. And it was really cool to hear the surprising way of what set her on this incredible Dhamma journey um, in the form of an Argentinian waiter at a news conference at a, at a conference in Peru. 
Yeah, that's right. You know, it's just, it's a matter of conditions, right? And when I reflect on that, it's like, I don't know how many people I've met like that, but if the internal conditions weren't ready to hear it and be kind of enthusiastic about it, then it, you know, it, so it's, it's like the internal, like, you know, like she was ready to hear that. And at that time when I heard what I needed to hear from, from whoever inspired me to take off and, and go on my journey, you know, that uh, maybe people have been saying that all my life and I wasn't ready for it, but uh so it's a timing thing sometimes. But yeah, it's always fascinating that there seems to be a lot of people we've noticed in our podcast can point to it's it was this book or it was this person, you know, and they can often point to like a, a, an event or a person or, or some kind of influence that got their journey started. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. That's a really good point that sometimes you might be hearing something consistently throughout your life, but it just takes a certain moment where it finally sinks in. And um you know, it, it was interesting as well to hear about the stages of development that she went through uh, on her journey, that she so many different layers really indicates her ability and her responsiveness and being able to move from different arenas and embrace the possibilities of the present moment. I just took some notes on some of those transformations. You know, you have Catholicism to perhaps agnosticism to an interest in Vipassana meditation to being a Buddhist nun. You have going from the Colombian countryside to the cosmopolitan city of Bogota to backpacking in South America to Asia to settling again in a Burmese monastery. Um, if you look at it on the practice scale, you're going from having no meditative practice to doing the Vipassana courses of SN Goenka, Pendita Rama, ITBMU, the university, and then to Pa Oak, and finally to nunhood in general. And what was really incredible about all these layers and journeys is it happened in such a short time. Like if you look at her age and her age now and the age when when this all got kicked off, it was like all these lifetimes and all these different moments happening in such a condensed period, um, such a full period. And so that was um, that was really cool. Right. I think it speaks to a certain uh, characteristic of of Sile. She she has this uh, openness uh, and courage. It's kind of a sense of adventure. It's a little bit of risk taking, but uh, and not all those transitions were easy. Some she was very enthusiastic about, but the, like the transition from Goenka to uh, Mahasi style meditation was, you know, there was a sticking point there, right? She said she felt guilty. And she, uh, but so then the courage to just move through that anyways and kind of trust her, her guts, so to speak, and and. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing in in uh, now this, the the uh, spectrum of the Dhamma life. You know, you, you, you've you've listed all these spectrums that uh, of transition um, and the willingness, uh, openness, like I said, and courage to move through that. But looking at practice, I think it's really important uh, in Dhamma to try different techniques in different environments. Um, and not always, you know, it's not like that's a. Uh, that's a time and place thing as well, right? So uh, to kind of follow inspiration, to because what we're inspired by, uh, what we're able to investigate, that's what keeps, for me at least, and for a lot of people I've talked to, and seem to be for her too, which is able to have the, which is free to follow her interest in Dhamma, then it stays alive. Then and and her her whole her whole story about Dhamma so far, and, you know, it's still continuing, but it's very, it's very alive, you know. Um, and within the Buddha Dhamma, there are many techniques and approaches. There's, there's no, like, one-size-fits-all technique, you know. And different people need different techniques, as we can see from the scriptures in the suttas, you know. Uh, the Buddha gave different uh, approaches. Now, I find the Dhamma to be quite fractal, you know, in one sense, you can enter from lots of different points, and then and then there's certain learnings so that we can understand. Uh, yeah, but, and then even within our own practice over a span of our lives, uh, you know, different techniques and teachers may suit us better at different times, you know, so, uh, but having that freedom to to discern for yourself, uh, of course, taking in, like she did at many points in her life, taking in the advice of others, you know, um, even or even in my case, uh, it's not just one teacher, one technique. I actually have like three three different practices I'm incorporating. Now they all, I think they all fit together quite well. But uh, you know, so there's just a lot of variety, and, and uh, um, 
Sile Piadasi is another example. You know, she used, uh, she said she used metta practice sometimes, white light nimitta sometimes, and general awareness, right? So she had a whole quiver of, of practices that she uses according to the, the conditions that arise, both internally and externally. So I think that uh, that's a nice environment for the development of wisdom, for uh, continued enthusiasm on the path. Um, you know, and, and she mentions the balance of pariyati as well. So, uh, you know, in Piyadasi, uh, pariyati, pariyati actually led to some of her deepest insights, which I think is, you know, uh, including that into the mix as well. So back to Sayale Kantichari, her, that willingness and courage, I think, and the, the, the feeling of freedom to move move about within the Dhamma sphere freely. is, uh, Yeah, it's, uh, time and time again, it just seems so fruitful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we should just mention for listeners, Sayale Piyadasi was the third episode, I believe, of this podcast. So definitely encourage those who haven't listened to that to go back and check her out. That was another great, uh, great interview. And hearing you talk about Sayale Kantichari, also Sayale Piyadasi, what strikes me is that you're describing the, the, the current practices of two contemporary meditators who are living and practicing right now. And so through them, we get a prism for what is possible in Myanmar, what the environment is like in Myanmar. I think this is why a lot of people perhaps um, uh, listen to this. A lot of meditators from home uh, enjoy it is that they are able to hear remotely what other people are doing and practicing in a place that they maybe haven't been or they're thinking of their own experience and coming here and what's possible for them. Uh, you know, I really appreciate getting to talk to these people for the obvious reasons, just because it's so inspiring. It's so great to bring in their reality into the greater world, to bring their voice so that more people can hear it. But as I was hearing you talk, another thing that came to mind was that the practitioners like Sayale Kentichari, Sayale Piyadasi, some of the others that we've had, um, these are really the kind of people that you meet in Burma when you come as a meditator. Uh, these are the kind of stories that you would hear if you were so lucky to come into contact with some of the many foreign and, and Burmese uh, meditators, monks and nuns that are here. And yet these are also voices and stories that do rarely get out into the world. And it made me reflect on one of the reasons why I was really excited to do this podcast was that um, the stories that I think we hear back in the West of practitioners from the West who've come to Burma, it seems to be dominated by people that were maybe a little higher up on the food chain, a little, little more of a name to themselves that um, were in the country many years ago. And maybe they sent, spent an extended time then and their experiences from that time are held as these reference points for how things are here, even though when you're here today as a meditator, there's often, often things feel very different from those stories. And so it's really great talking to these people that represent a lived Dhamma life as it is manifesting in contemporary times and to be able to learn and hear how their life wisdom and stories are informing this newer generation of practitioners that are coming and then building on their shoulders, hearing what they're doing, what's possible for them, the decisions they made. And that's then informing a new generation of people to come and make their own choices. So, um, so, so that part was, uh, was really cool to hear in, um, in say like Kentachari, of course, uh, other past, uh, uh, podcast guests as well. Right. Uh, I can't remember exactly how she phrased it, but like, you know, Burma is like this, uh, it's like a buffet of, of uh, opportunity and Dhamma growth, right? I think, uh, you know, and she came, she came through Goenka, you know, and, and, and Goenka, the Goenka organization uh, throughout the world does provide a lot of people with a gateway into Dhamma. And, uh, you know, I remember recalling uh, Abayagiri monks looking at the profiles of the monks that were uh, currently at Abayagiri. This was several years ago, but, you know, several of them, about half of them had started in Cuenca and then ended up being monks. But the unique thing about about um, Myanmar is it's uh, is this buffet, right? And it's not just a buffet of techniques. You know, it's more than that. It's it's um, there's an opportunity for lay or monastic, which is another spectrum. There's an opportunity for pariyati and patipati, uh, and, and there's different types of actual techniques. Uh, and then all kinds of other things that are off the radar, just chance meetings of inspiration. It's just, it's just all around you. And it's not in every single place all the time, but there's so much there for, there's someone to have an unplanned journey too that just kind of bumps into uh, things along the way that, that are inspiring, you know? So 
it's, this is a unique thing. You know, there's other places, perhaps like Thailand and Sri Lanka, that would offer something similar. But, you know, as our listeners are spread throughout the world, that's not necessarily that, that richness that of all these spectrums isn't necessarily available everywhere. So this is like one reason someone might, might come to a place like Myanmar. Right, right, exactly. And this this is also why these, you know, you had mentioned that when you're here, there's this rich diversity of stories and places and experiences that you're able to have. Um, however, uh, you know, even sometimes when you're here, it, it, it takes a certain kind of serendipity and meeting the right person or going to the right place and even then having the, you know, contextual and cultural and linguistic clues to be able to make sense of what that experience is. And so that's another real gift and pleasure of, of what this podcast project is for us is in all of our years of experience there and all of our contacts and our network, you can say to bring in these special voices who sometimes are living in, you know, a very high degree of, of private meditative experience and seclusion and are really generously donating their time to tell these stories that, that listeners are getting access to as gold, just arriving right in their earbuds that, um, you know, even if you were in the country would, would take quite a bit of time to access. So it's just really fun and, and rewarding to be able to, uh, to bring those stories to, to meditators right now. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and you can come for all kinds of different reasons and all different kinds of stages in, uh, in practice. But, uh, one of the important things, and I think we've seen this is because of this spectrum that's available it invites it invites some people in in certain stages of their journey like what i call like coming out of the childhood stage and into the kind of the adolescent stage where you know if you want to come out of the adolescent stage but but you only have one thing available to you it's hard you know but when you when you're in the environment of Myanmar and you have all these options then you know you can you can start to navigate your own way in a way, you know, through serendipity or just through uh, kind of gut feeling and trying different things through, through, you know, you're, you're likely to come into more contact with people that have done different things. And then you have to decide that <laughs> there's almost so much available. You have to decide like what feels, what feels right. Does it feel right to go deeper into the tradition I've been in or the, or the tradition that I'm currently investigating or, or to move into something else, you know, or to switch to pariati, or to try taking robes for a while. Like, I mean, and then in that decision making, you kind of make it your own. And I think this is important for me. I see that uh, making the journey our our own is such an important thing, you know. And she did this. She she didn't know that's what she was doing. Uh, Sayali Piyadazi also didn't know. She thought she was going to something that was conducive to her Goenka practice. Uh, and and it didn't turn out that way. But what it did turn out to be is like a hugely influential that kind of broadened and deepened her 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 whole Dhamma path. And and this is the same thing with too Sile uh, Kantichari. Same thing, you know. She she takes these risks and this has these great rewards. And uh, and yeah, it's it's inspiring. Every every one you know, not all our podcasts are about people's personal journeys, but the ones that are that are this unfolding that happens because of the variety and richness of, of possibilities of Dhamma in, in Myanmar is, uh, yeah, it's inspiring. Yeah. And we have to say as well that the, you know, the real superstar in the background here that's consistent across the different episodes is Burma. You know, Burma is the grounds that are making all this possible. Of course, as, as you said, we're telling these stories of spiritual personal development, really, really kind of mini hero's journey in each podcast of those people who do share their life and background. Not every guest does, as you said, but um, they are the hero's journey that we're covering and exploring. And, you know, a great thing about a hero's journey is the, the, the hero and the journey itself could be very, very different from any thing that you could ever take yourself, but there's certain kind of parallels that do relate to your life and your decisions. And um, one of the consistencies that we do find in all these heroes journeys, of course, because of the nature of our podcast, is the role that Myanmar is playing in their 
uh, in their dis- their spiritual decision making, and that really gets into what you said just a moment ago that um, they were on Piyadasi and Kantachari, others as well were on this this journey of kind of discovering how they wanted to practice, who they wanted to practice with, what best suited them, what the monastic life was made of, or the meditator's life was made of, and how much of this, how much of that. And that sort of exploration and playfulness is very well suited to a place like Myanmar where foreigners are just treated, you know, like just embraced with open arms um, to come in and, 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 and have that Dhammic experience. And the opportunities, if you seek them, um, are so plentiful. And that is something that is, is extremely unusual in the world. It's pretty much impossible, I'd venture to say, to that extent in much of the non-Buddhist world. And even in other Buddhist countries, that level of richness um, would probably be hard to come by. And so this is the, the context that these heroes' journeys are playing out in. Right. And the context, uh, th- yeah, that's exactly what I was, I was referring to. Uh, and then, and then just the, the outcome is so, and you're right. It doesn't matter. It's not like following someone else's recipe here. I mean, you could, but it's like, as they unfold for different people, it could be different traditions. It could be, and it's not about like, you know, you must take robes or, or you must do this, or you must study this percentage of Pariyati. You know, it's like, it's different for everyone, but that's all available here. And the best part is the outcomes. Like you can hear it in, in, in them, the, the enthusiasm, the, the inspiration, the insights that just, you know, they're not trying to teach anything, but they just say something and there's so much wisdom in it and they're just expressing the, their experience uh, and then the results of it. And you can, I can feel it when I hear it and it's, it's inspiring. So uh, it, inspires me to keep going and investigating on, on my path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's the goal, of course, that we have for, uh, you know, for listeners as, as their uh, meditators, as they're tagging along is, uh, to, to f- kind of follow these journeys and the ups and downs of the, the speaker, and then uh, also see the set of choices that they're making and, and that hopefully have that be somewhat inspiring for, you know, everyone's own personal hero's journey as they go on, as they're listening. Absolutely. Yeah. And kind of going back to that point of Burma being the superstar, you know, Burma being the background um, of spiritual possibilities. um, Another thing I want to throw into that mix is that importantly, it's the teachings of Gwankaji that is the seed that brings her here. And to just take a moment to recognize and reflect that no other tradition or Dhamma education option could have reached her life in South America, except for those Vipassana courses of Gwenka. And it's funny, you talk about connecting other podcasts, um, uh, other guests that we've had. And of course, you know, we can't, we have to think of Daniel, who, uh, Daniel Mayer, who uh, was a, as a senior teacher in the Goenka tradition and then and led retreats all over South America. And one of the comments we made, I can't remember if I made it to him or to you, but it was on that podcast was the sense that he was, uh, that, that this tradition um, was literally bringing uh, a, a Vipassana meditation and Dhamma and the teachings of the Buddha to villages throughout South America that in all of human history had never received those before. That was pretty awe-inspiring just to think of of this spread of these teachings of liberation through Goenkaji system and organization happen, reaching some of these far corners that literally in the sweep of human history had never been reached. She is one of the beneficiaries. We heard about one of the people bringing it. Now we hear about one of the beneficiaries who's receiving it. So she is getting these seeds from this tradition. And then as we uh, talked about um, somewhat humorously on the podcast, of course, there's no direct flights from Colombia to Burma, but here she ended up anyway. And as she, and there's not so many Colombians um, in uh, in Myanmar, probably not so many South Americans uh, uh, as well. But once she gets here, she really embraces the opportunity of what Burma has to offer. She lives at the Pandita Center for 11 months. She has a free education at ITBMU for several years. She tries out ordination. Um, and she's now living in this, in this vibrant and robust Dhamma community combined with these Burmese lay supporters um, all over the country that, that are taking care of her needs for uh, what she needs for her practice and her spiritual growth. Um, and so it's just interesting seeing that relationship, you know, get, getting these valuable seeds of Dhamma that, uh, that she was able to get at the right time at the right place um, that any time before her couldn't have arrived in that way. And then those seeds bringing her here, which is quite a remarkable story, and then really making the most of the opportunities that exist in a country like this um, and the buffet table, as you mentioned. Yeah, the metaphor that came in my mind is is uh, uh, 
the seeds landed when, when you come to Burma, they land in this really fertile s- soil so much so that like just like plants actually grow in the tropics, you know, especially during rainy season, they just burst to life, you know. And so her her dhamma practice really just seemed to like really burst into this rich, colorful uh, tapestry of experience. Right, right, exactly. And then if you also kind of follow that relationship, um, uh, maybe the causal relationship or what came before and what came after a little more closely, it's interesting. It's interesting just to look at monasticism. You know, monasticism is not really known in the West that much um, as the Buddhist teachings came to the West. They this is uh, far beyond the points we can make here. This has been covered in in, in so many books and scholars um, that have looked at the way these teachings have been received in Western countries that didn't have a monastic order and would be too far a reach to create one or try to understand one. So they were modified, adjusted for a lay audience. This is certainly what happened. Um, uh, what happens in in the Guanca system, and so. Uh, as they're taking these Vipassana courses, they're on uh, a path of practicing in a committed relationship, which is really what the tradition encourages. But they start to have these, um, these as they get into Myanmar and they see what's possible, they do start to uh, to see the opportunities of ordination. And I, I just kind of laughed at this point because I was reminded of a, a mutual friend of ours who is a, uh, is a lifelong monk. He's also a, a former Goenka meditator from Europe. And he's often quoted the story of um, uh, uh, of hearing a, t- a particular teacher say um, that when uh, meditators had this renunciation uh, idea and push and and desire, that it was a renunciation sankara, and that this was something you needed to come out of. And uh, and this is not so unusual. I mean, this is when you're when you're practicing within a tradition and in a country where there is um, there's not this practice or understanding of of real, total, complete renunciation into an ordained life. The, when these desires come, they are something to observe and to let go of and to to stay in, on that path of of lay practice in a committed relationship. But then once they came to this buffet table and they saw the option, the 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 dish of ordination or the dishes of ordination. And that's um those were conditions that they they met at that time well there's there's two sides to it there's the one you're talking about which i'd like to say something about but the other side is like first it was as a lay person what is it like to be around people that as dedicated as we might think some people are in the, in the goenka organization with the you know like volunteering to teach or run a center or that and there's there's a whole nother level. I mean, I, that's to be commended, of course. And then there's a whole nother level where someone's like, it's 100%. And, and the reason I bring that up is because that's exactly what she said when she, when she met Upandita, that here's this monk. And, or, or what's it like? First, it was just monks she met, you know, and just saw like how they're operating at a, at a, a meditation course or an international meditation center. That they're just, it's 100%. That's all they do. And then she has a teacher that's a monastic and, and just how inspiring that was and how much trust she had in that and of the depth and breadth of, of this person's experience. And that, that played a role in her Dhamma life, just having monks and, and nuns around her that were totally dedicated. And then, of course, her own journey as well. Like, um, I do think it's, uh, I, it makes me sad to hear people discourage people from from the monastic life it's not for everyone and it's it's not perfect there's problems at the same time like i wouldn't trade my three years as a monk for anything it like i was just thinking about this the other day and talking with friends i miss it sometimes um and as much as i try to dedicate i have an intention to be mindful all the time and still practice all the time and it's just it that environment, there's something very special about it. There's a reason that the Buddha set it up. It's very clear to me from my experience when you actually graze in that field, so to speak, when you when you wander and graze in that field, it's so rich. You know, you're it just the those conditions are very special. And if if you're called to them temporarily or for, for longer, I, I I mean I couldn't recommend it more. You know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, to me and to the people around me uh, and, and we hear the, you know, in these podcasts, in these stories of monastics, the lay people, too, also have great stories to tell. But there is 
uh, it's not an either or kind of thing or this is the pinnacle, but it's something available that I think is extremely special. Uh, and I like to play that up, you know, for anyone that's interested that this is available and it's something very rich. Yeah, sure. And following their story, it was um, it was just so fascinating that she started to describe the steps that w w were leading to their their um, you know inverse proportional uh, greater commitment to Dhamma gradual dissolution of the marriage um, that these these were taking place. They um, uh, they were still exploring the Dhamma in a committed relationship um, for much of their spiritual journey, even when they were putting on the robes initially. They, they were temporary ordinations, but somehow over time, they saw that life was a, this was a real possibility of how life could be lived. Um, you know, ordaining is a big decision for anyone. Um, anyone has to give up a lot, but to have a husband and wife simultaneously making this decision, prioritizing their commitment to oneself or to Dhamma in different different ways as they move on. It's something that doesn't happen overnight. It's something that gradually one realizes that the partner is not ever again going to be prioritized over the practice and really kind of realizing that simultaneously. Um, and one starts to ask, what is it that I'm really prioritizing? And the interesting thing about that is that for, you know, this is something that I think people in different walks of life might, I think many people think, you know, what, what are my life priorities and what are my overarching goals? And, you know, what, what are the, 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 the driving forces and the things I want to accomplish? But with a meditator, this is not a question of like a, an overarching great goal. This is a moment to moment significance because you're watching the mind moment to moment. You're watching things arise. You're watching them pass away and so you're having to give a, a momentary awareness one moment after the next of what you really are prioritizing and um and eventually as we heard in in her story that what they prioritize simultaneously together became the practice over the the lay worldly commitment of marriage and uh, and that's what followed and i really appreciated her honesty and openness and sharing you know it was it was it was so vulnerable as she said at one point um or i'm not this is not a direct quote something like you know i i, I actually found this was really a, a theravada love story but i couldn't quite see it at the time um and uh and i i could see another um kind of version of this story being told in a way that kind of romanticizes it, that, that romanticizes the Dhamma and the, 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 um, reclusive practice and, you know, just the all out commitment to the inner purification. Um, and that other version of the story that's being romanticized would, um, would be less honest. It would be something that is, uh, is just kind of painting this, this, this picture, this inspiring picture, but it's not really on the ground of the real human emotions and, um, and feelings. And, you know, talking to her, you do sense the, the pain and the loss, um, and the honesty of expressing that even as she stands by her decision. And I think that was, um, that was wonderful of her, for her to be able to, to be able to, I felt very privileged in, in the moment of that interview that she was going there and allowing us to hear that. And I think it was very important for meditators to also hear that, um, just that human element at play, um, in what is a very, um, you know, a very courageous decision, but we're still hearing those small human feelings and emotions that, um, um, you know, that remind us these are real person, these are real people and real things and that the, 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 the ability to identify and humanize with the stories that we're hearing, um, becomes all the more, uh, in depth. Right. That was, yeah, that was a special, uh, uh, sharing. I, I really appreciate it as well. It's, it reminds me of like what you're talking about is these momentary realizations that, yeah, this, you know, this is, this is what I prioritize. Um, but there's a consistency to those moments that kept adding up to like, yeah, let's renounce. So if we look at it as like a scale, you know, yeah, the scales consistently are tipping towards ordaining and dissolving the marriage. That doesn't mean the scales, like all the weights on one side and, and there's nothing on the other side, you know, it's, it's favoring, it's favoring that decision, but there's still stuff on the other side. And, and it, it, even though, you know, you know, even though she knew what she wanted to do, it's still, yeah, it is, it is painful to let go of, of, of what's on the other side sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, uh, 
related to this, I, I have to give a little bit of background since um, coming from um, from Burma back to, uh, to being in Colorado now and taking advantage of the, the resources that we have in this country. One of the first things I did when I was back was go to the library and check out you know, half a dozen books on podcasting and interviewing just to try to get this whole shindig we're doing, um, make sure it's the uh, the top quality it can be. And one of the things I, I read from there that I picked up was in interviewing the value of a mental scene or imagery being painted that, um, especially in podcasting or oral interviews where all you have to hang on is the person's words. So you really want to have a, a scene, a room described where, where every aspect of that, um, interaction or environment is something that you can, you can feel in here. Um, I, I, to no credit of my own, there was a moment that happened like this on the podcast and I just want to, um, want to uh, remind uh, our listeners and remind myself and, and and appreciate just the vividness of this. So there's this part where she describes, you know, first the, she, she describes this mental acceptance to dissolve the marriage and the legal process of doing so. And she told this story of how it overlapped when um, she and her now monk ex-husband were in the country at the same time and um, they hadn't planned it, but she, she kind of had to even remember, oh yeah, that's right. He was here and I was here and oh yeah, he did uh, he was invited to to my home and she describes her home as being, you know, it's in the countryside. It's a very Catholic upbringing. She has this, this mother-in-law or she, or her mother, who's her, her now monk ex-husband's former mother-in-law who is trying to understand all of this, all the dissolution of the, uh, the, the dissolution of the marriage, the, um, um, the renunciation, the uh, decision to follow a spiritual path that uh, is very different from her own upbringing, the uh, to say nothing of the rules of the monks and nuns and how you serve them, and uh, you know, and also uh, beyond this, all, I think she mentioned accepting there's not going to be any grandchildren coming from this once union that maybe she had hoped for, and then in the midst of all this, there is her now monk former son-in-law sitting down who has to be served in a certain way at a certain time in their home and just the 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 imagery of the way that she was describing it really um uh really put you there or at least put me there in all of these worlds coming together right well uh what do i say to that i don't really <laughs> i don't really have i don't really have much more to say other than like uh it reminds me of my response is like oh well <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> like the the Chris Farley uh, interviews on Saturday Night Live, uh, where uh, he uh, there's a, a cool story and he doesn't really go anywhere with it. He just says, oh, "Hey, <laughs> that's awesome." <laughs> that yeah, was right. Awesome. And- yeah, to peek be, to peek behind the curtain a little bit. That's a inner reference we've had in preparing for these talks. That sometimes we find that there's things that people say that we want to give context to, we want to debate or analyze or share our own experience, and then there's some things that are said in this podcast that are so cool that are just awesome that we we've called them we've we've <laughs> called them Farleyisms that we just we just want to say hey remember the time when she said this and this and this and yeah that was awesome we don't really have much more than that so <laughs> this is one of those moments maybe. <laughs> Well, it was for me, for sure. I mean, other than the, you know, the uh, perhaps some background for people about about monastics. I don't know about the um, the nuns because the the nuns these days are on uh, they're on eight or, or ten precepts. Uh, some are on eight to, in order to help out. Maybe we could explain that a little bit just for interest. Uh, m- monasteries often need people to handle money, and some siles. Uh, just take eight precepts so they don't have the touching money prohibition. A lot of the siles are on 10 precepts. Um, there are in the world uh, nuns these days that take the full, it's over 300 uh, uh, rules. Uh, but for the monks, it's 227, but there's a requirement to become a monk. I don't think she probably didn't have have this, but in, in relationship to parents, you actually need your parents' permission. You know, I was like 40... 40 something at the time and I still needed my 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 father was alive at the time and my and my mother uh, I needed their permission to become a monk so uh, and it, it and just just it, it did it did kind of kick up uh, those memories of uh, of of kind of saying goodbye to people too and uh, uh, and mm-hmm. that saying goodbye to a whole life you know for her mm. it was another step of of marriage but I was still like you know my my gig was to go home for six months and work and come back and when I was home I lived out of my pickup truck and I just had this incredible amount of freedom and a cool job that I really loved to do in the outdoors and uh and all these friends that I could just so freely um go around and visit but uh 
you know, I, I, I traded freedoms. You know, a lot of people think that the monastic life is a loss of a lot of freedoms because we, we look at it in terms of our own life. But when when you look at the 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 lay life in and of itself, uh, it's not as free as we think sometimes, you know, because all the things we have to, we have to do, we have to work, we have to make money, you know, and uh, the Buddha kind of created this support system where the monks could be free of, of family obligations and financial obligations and just live so simply with just a bowl and robes and a razor and, you know, just your flip flops and just a couple little things, you know, that you could all kind of carry and walk around with. Uh, and that's a freedom uh, freedom from money. I mean, it's an incredible freedom. Going back to Usarna's, uh, Ashin Sarna's uh, podcast, you know, that uh, the monks that really follow that rule of, of not holding and making mon- uh, monetary decisions is a freedom. Uh, it, there's nothing like it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I hope everyone gets it some way, somehow has a chance to be able to live without the burden of money. Mm, right. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, so anything else to wrap up with hers? I don't think so. I, I just another really inspiring uh, uh, personal story of, of I just really liked, you know, I mean, I like all of them, but I like these ones mm-hmm. where the person's really in, just engaged in their own uh, decision making and serendipity and, and self discernment and, and just how much uh, wisdom and inspiration and, and uh, enthusiasm comes out of it. So for me yeah. personally, that's really affects me. Yeah. You know, and I think that, um, from, from the guest side, they often come to these interviews, not really knowing what to expect. These are not, for the most part, these are not public savvy, uh, speakers that are used to presenting their message to the world. Many of them have never done anything like this in, in their life. And so they don't really know what to expect. Some of them I have, uh, my own personal relationship with them might vary from, um, from from only having met them a little bit to ve- being very long friends for a, a period of time. But even however our relation is, they don't really know what's going to happen in that interview. That's some of the mystery of it. And um, just your remark uh, in, in reflecting on being on the other side and hearing what they have to say, it reminded me of what one guest said um, a month ago or so. He uh, he had quite a uh, quite an intense emotional interview, really revealing his, his whole Dhamma journey, remembering things he hadn't thought of in many years and uh one point when the mic went off at one point he just kind of shook his head and said this is really like a dhamma therapy seat you got going on here so you know people <laughs> people bring what they uh, and that's great you know it's great for people to, to to bring that level of openness and vulnerability and uh you know i think that that listeners and meditators can only benefit from hearing such unusual and remarkable people with these stories share them so openly and freely in this kind of forum so yeah, it's like a Dhamma barbershop, huh? You have time to sit there. <laughs> there <laughs> People you go. start telling their stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, um, so yeah, so I think we're good there. We have another, uh, have some, some coming down the pipeline. We, um, we, we should give another technical note that we're, uh, obviously I'm not in Burma right now. All of the interviews were recorded there, but we, uh, before we, before I left, uh, Yangon unexpectedly with the virus, we did have uh, a number of interviews, sit down interviews that were recorded. So we have at least, you know, I don't know, 15, 16 sessions of interviews already recorded, already in the bank that we're just looking to produce and to put out there. And we'll be looking at doing some, some remote interviews now that we're all practicing social distancing and, uh, and also some of these, these special coronavirus, um, interviews that will give some, some, some some good thought for meditators out there and also share what's going on in um in Myanmar at the the monasteries as we talked about at the, the start of the episode and um in general we just hope that you know people will be listening to this in all different ways in all different places some might be listening to it a year from now but for those that are listening to it in current times we know that uh financially um in terms of the fear in the mind in terms of the uh, economics uh and health that uh, this is a hard time for a lot of people. So we hope that these two hours or whatever it was provided um, some kind of relief and interest and inspiration for those listening at this time. Right. Uh, we're ready to roll with the changes for sure. So, and we hope we provide something helpful and useful to people. So again, I yep. hope everyone out there is, is well and stays healthy and, uh, and keeps uh, mindful and, and relaxed as best as possible. And, and not only being 
the best space we're in that the Dhamma helps us through our practice uh, can help a lot of people around us as well to stay calm and relaxed and and make good decisions and help each other, you know, and uh, we could we could freak out and, and, and fight against each other for resources and things like this, or we can really, you know, be relaxed and, and just try to try to yeah, be kind to ourselves and to everyone else. And hopefully everyone stays healthy. Yeah, well said. Well said. And um, best wishes to everyone out there. And we'll be back in another week and a half with another episode. All right. Great. Okay, great. Great to check in with you, Zach. And uh, take care. Stay safe in uh, Thailand. Thanks. Will do. I, I'm worried more about elephants at night than the COVID <laughs> virus at the moment. But uh, All right. Yeah. Thanks. Right. I appreciate that. Likewise, baby, there in Salida. Yeah, ba- baby elephants. So, uh, um, so uh, uh, the, the listener will have to go back and uh, and hear the previous uh, episodes for your encounter with uh, baby elephants and flower. Flower snorting uh, teenage yeah. elephants. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it came back actually. That same that same adolescent came back a few nights ago. Oh gosh. Although I didn't have quite the same encounter as <laughs> staring right into its eyes from thirty feet away. You know. Uh huh. But nonetheless, yeah, it uh, came back and went straight to the kitchen, I think. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. Okay. We'll see you, huh? Okay. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye. Yeah. We would also like to take this time to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, especially our two sound engineers, Martin Combs and Tharnge, along with Zach Hessler, content collaborator and part time co host. Ken Pransky helps with editing. Kishing Bat Campbell does our social media templates, and Dragos Bandita and Andre Francois make our sketches. We'd also like to thank everyone who has assisted us bringing the guests who have made up the show thus far, as well as the guests themselves for agreeing to come and share. Finally, we are immensely grateful for the donors who made this entire thing possible. (laughs) 